This is Herschel's house, and from here he pretty much ran the music scene in Bath. He taught, he composed, and he arranged the concerts at the assembly rooms. He was a very successful musician and impresario. In fact, one of the great figures in the musical life of late 18th century Britain. But music making was only half of Herschel's life. In the daytime, he'd be making music up there, but as night fell, he'd come down here to the bowels of the building. In this little room behind the kitchen, Herschel would spend night after night grinding mirrors of the highest optical quality in order to create the most sophisticated telescopes of his age. Herschel spent many hours in this little back garden with his telescopes, often in the bitter cold, observing the night sky. And on one such night, the 13th of March, 1781, he made his big discovery, the unfortunately named planet Uranus. There's a man with a telescope in a field. Hi, Chris. Oh yeah, how are I'm, you? I'm good, thank you. Look, the first thing I've got to ask you is, how significant was it that Herschel discovered a new planet? Well, I think it was the most significant discovery of his century and, and several since. You see, for the whole of human history, the ancient Greeks, everyone knew there were six planets. The Earth and the five that you can see with the naked eye moving amongst the stars. And suddenly, Herschel, with his giant telescope, adds not just a new star, not just a, a new fuzzy patch, but a new world to what we knew about the cosmos. Haydn comes to Britain, and he's heard of this celebrated astronomer, the man who's discovered Uranus, and of course he's dead keen to see him, and finally the two do meet. What do you think Herschel would have shown him? Well, I'm sure they talked about music, but I have this image as well of Haydn being led out the back of Herschel's house and into the observatory and shown these enormous telescopes with which Herschel was making his name. Well, Haydn was clearly absolutely, I mean, he marvelled at the, the actual sight of the telescope itself, let alone what he could see through it. And at the cost of it. And he wrote down in his diary uh, about how, how expensive this thing was and how much Herschel was making as a telescope maker. So there's clearly some mercenary. Maybe that's what they talked about. Maybe everything we've been imagining is ridiculous and they sat and compared bank statements for, a de <laughs> for an hour or two. I'm sure they will have poured over Herschel's star maps, his drawings, probably the page with Uranus carefully sketched in. You can imagine the book being opened and passed round along with the scores. Um, and perhaps they stood there on a rainy, miserable night like this and Herschel maybe told Haydn what he wanted to show him. And maybe I should do the same. I wanted to show you an object called the Orion Nebula. You can see it with the naked eye. It's a faint, misty patch. Herschel was the first to realize that this is a place where stars are being born. Perhaps he stood there talking to Haydn, saying, well, I can show you where our solar system came from. Was Haydn's depiction of the beginnings of our universe, many years later, the legacy in sound from that encounter with Herschel? Its extraordinary zero-gravity harmony takes us to the edge of the known musical universe. This is radical music. Herschel's career seems to me to be about expansions. You start with the solar system that we know, and he adds a planet to it. He doesn't remove the solar system, we add something. Mm -hmm. 
Haydn was religious, Herschel was a religious man as well. So these discoveries aren't challenging God or, or the established religion at all. But it's a grander universe for God to have created and, and for astronomers and musicians to play in, I suppose. In 1792, Haydn's first British visit came to an end, and he returned home to Austria for just over a year. The son of a rural wheelwright, Haydn had trained as a choir boy at St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. In his twenties, he'd gone into service with the Esterhazy family in the small town of Eisenstadt, 30 miles southeast of Vienna. The magnificent Esterhazy Palace was to prove the perfect laboratory for the young composer's extraordinary talents. So, Walter, am I imagining Haydn walking to work along this corridor every day? He did, yeah. He wasn't living in a palace, but this was his workshop. So to be there twice a day, speaking with the prince, to get the wishes from him, what kind of music he, he wants to hear or what he has to prepare. Yeah. And, yeah, and then he, he, he rehearsed here with the musicians. He's rehearsing in this room. In this room and maybe rooms next to this, right. to this, so... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, God. This is some adventure playground. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. I always say this is Haydn's Graceland. Yeah. <laughs> and you so can hear... Ah, the most beautiful acoustic. It wasn't like this, the acoustic, because uh, the wood wasn't here. Okay. It, when he came in here, so he found this place, yeah? Wonderful hall, big hall. With a marble floor, though? With the marble floor, and this is not so good for acoustic conditions. So he asked the prince to put locks, wood on it, so that it's better for the end. And now we find even the bills of the carpenters who did this in 1761. So Haydn asked for conditions to have the perfect, the perfect situation. Like I said, it was a workshop for him. So you said, wow, when you came in here, yeah? So maybe Haydn did this well and he had to compose symphonies for the, for the prince. There were no symphonies before, so Haydn came here and, this, and we have this famous uh, number six, seven and eight now, symphony, the Matin, midi, soir. morning, uh, lunchtime and, and, and the evening, and look up on the ceiling. That's what it is. We have Laurora, the goddess of, of sunrise, on, on the carriage, and yeah, we have here La Luna. And it's the evening, yeah? <laughs> the evening goddess. And in the middle, this marriage on the Olympus. But it's noon. God, that is incredible. So, morning, noon, Absolutely. evening. Absolutely. Number six, seven, and an eight now. So the man himself is in here, he looks up at his pictures, how practical. Right, I'll write a piece of music about that one, then that one, and that one. And in, in, in every movement, there are solo parts into it for his musicians. So he's playing to the strengths of the particular yeah. hot musicians within the orchestra. Yeah. Yeah. So this was also very clever, because what did he do? He showed to the prince, you engaged perfect musicians, look, what, look how, how wise you did. And to the musicians he showed, I look, after, I, I look after you that you have perfect music to play, to show off in front of the prince, to show off what you really can do, and so, yeah, and this developed.
Prince Nicholas of Esterhazy could trust Haydn to keep him at the cutting edge of symphonic invention, but he also had a rather touching passion for an unusual and archaic instrument. What is this wonderful instrument? Well, it's called a baritone. It has six or sometimes seven strings like this one. And they're tuned a little bit like a guitar or a lute. It's not easy to play. I mean, okay, if you play viol, there's one thing, but, but um, this thing. Now, hang on a minute. This is a whole other set of strings behind the set of strings you were showing us. Yes. And that can create problems. I mean, you, you have to work on that. So you're too. playing with the thumb of your left hand yes. on the strings I, at the back? I plug them. Oh, it's all about multitasking. That's it. And that's the problem about it. <laughs> so you can accompany yourself in the worst case. For example, like this. And that's what makes the sound special, but what makes it a little hard to play. So there's not too many people trying to do that. <laughs> You know, had the prince not played the baritone, do you think Haydn would have written nearly so much music for the instrument? I'm sure he wouldn't have written anything. Because even in those times, it was a very special instrument. After just a few years at Esterhazy, Prince Nicholas rewarded him with the post of head of music. And Haydn was able to buy his first house just down the road from the palace. This is his house where he lived. So, and he worked from here, and we have this little thing here. <laughs> Is that his piano? Yeah, his forte piano. Anton Walter built this from Vienna, was very famous at this time. I always say, please don't touch. <laughs> yeah. But, I but think, being as I'm with you, what do you but think? But I think we can, we can manage this. So Fantastic. Maybe you try. <laughs> have a try. Wow. Beautiful, delicate little sound, just as you'd expect. They're such little perfect instruments, these Viennese forte pianos. This is a Valta, and I think I'm right in saying Mozart had a Valta as well. Yeah, in his birthplace in Salzburg, they have a forte piano. They thought it's an Anton Walter. And when this was restored, they found out it's from the same piece of wood. No. <laughs> so they brought us. <laughs> That is ridiculous. And Haydn and Mozart are friends. These so. two great masters, yeah, Haydn and Mozart, both own forty pianos, which are drawn from the same tree. That is quite remarkable. A good coincidence, I think. Look at this picture, yeah? So now, that is the famous image of Haydn, isn't it? A younger man, yeah. 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 He's on his forty piano composing. He's got a very kind face. Do you agree with that? He himself said, I'm not a, a handsome man. <laughs> But uh, women loved me anyway. <laughs> but, uh, um, he was good humoured, and I'm sure you could see this in his face that he loved to talk with people, that he was in peace with himself. And I think this is very important to understand also his music. He struggled, of course, like everyone struggles in his life. And you can hear it in, in his music sometimes, but it always ends in peace and with hope. It's always a bright future at the end. Well, it's a very interesting thing, because if you think about any piece of his music, of course it will have moments of melancholy, it will have moments of sheer high spirits, and lots of other things in between. Mm -hmm. But it never quite goes to that dark place that Mozart, say, does, where it's like he's gouging your soul out. He is more grounded, I think so. He, where he left, he, he knew he has a place in life. Maybe Mozart travelled too much as a young boy. Didn't he have a home? Haydn had a home. And he had this region here. Of course, it wasn't so easy for him. But I think this is very important to understand. He wasn't torn apart. <laughs> 